ever had, um, well, I'm pretty sure you have, uh, but just moments of where you're listening to a podcast or you're reading a book and you read something and you're just like, you know, that's, it kind of just captures you and you're just like, ah, I'm, I, I just can't really leave, leave that behind. Um, uh, for me, it, it, a couple weeks ago, I was listening to a podcast called Smartless. Um, I don't know anybody ever heard of it. it Jason Bateman and I, uh, the guy from Will and Grace. I can't remember his name. Sean, Sean Hayes. Uh, Sean Hayes, and then the other guy. The other guy. <laughs> yeah, the other guy. He used to be married to Amy Poehler. Uh, yeah, but uh, they were interviewing uh, Steven Spielberg, and and they were giving uh, you know. Uh, technical about like his process and and um and they asked him you know has any movie that you that you have created come out exactly like you envisioned and uh, he talked about how there is no such thing uh, that exists every movie that he has directed has has come out to be better than what he originally envisioned because of the people that are involved in the process, and as he's doing this interview, he's naming people that none of us would would know. Um, um, and he saw the people that were part of this process. And this is what I found like I just really captured me as interesting is not as distillers in the process, but enhancers, people that didn't take away from the vision, but they added to it. It. His movies, although his name as director is on them, are the collective um, expression of not just him, but of, of many. Um, they're part of this collaborative process. I sometimes um, get questions from, from people curious about this church and particularly about church planting. And I'm somewhat of a, I'm, I'm extroverted, but I'm also introverted. So I'm not like really good with like small talk, like unless I have like pre like thought out answers. And and so sometimes when people ask me stuff, I just like that really sounded the dumbest thing in the world that I've ever said is because it's like that was just like right from my brain to my mouth. Uh, and I didn't have time to like process. Um, but they asked me about church planting and and there's different types of church plants. Um, there's some plant church plants called anchor plants in like. This is funny to the outside world that knows nothing about it's like is this like a gardening club that you're doing <laughs> um, but uh, there's anchor plants which you start from an established church and congregation and they they financially sustain you and you partner um, but this this particular church plant is what's called a pioneer plant which means the funding just comes from the conference and there's no like church particular church partner and so people are like you did it all by yourself um, and that, and I don't have like a pre-planned answer. And I'm just like, um, I guess so. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, and people are like from scratch. And I'm like, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, like that's my introvert. Like I don't have like an answer. Um, and, um, and I felt like whatever I said was not a great answer because the truth is, is that this expression of, Hi. <laughs> Um, this expression of, of, of church is not from scratch. It's not something that my family did by ourselves. Um, it's a collective effort of, of people, you, me, all of us together um, is this church. Yes, there wasn't like a main church, but there isn't like... I would not even consider myself a found like you know how pa like founding pastor. I don't like founding pastor. Like I'm not a found like I'm not a founder in that way. Like I found a group of people that had the same dreams and visions that I did, and here we are. Um, it was a work of togetherness. Um, prior to the scripture uh, that we'll read, the the prior scripture of this uh, Matthew text. And a few weeks during Lent is uh, Jesus' uh, temptation in the wilderness of fasting 40 days and 40 nights. And then there's this shift. Um, after John is arrested, Jesus begins his, uh, his ministry in Galilee. Um, 
I think we sometimes forget how large and influential um, of a figure John was. Um, that the reason he was arrested is because he was so influential. Um, and he constantly was preaching and uh, challenging the, um, uh, the rulers like Herod Antipas in that region, which finally got so fed up with him that he, he arrested him and he put himself in jail. And some, some people think that in this scripture, Jesus is going to Capernaum and Galilee to like kind of lay low. Um, uh, because the thought is that Jesus, before he was like this ministry leader, was, um, was very much a follower of John and under John's, under John's wing. And so when we see Jesus kind of come out of the gates in the scripture and he begins his ministry, uh, we might think, uh, here is Jesus getting ready like to start this thing from scratch. <laughs> um, by the way, I'm going to go here. This is going to bother me. Uh, Jesus, as we talk about you, we want you to be here with us. Um, I don't know if this, like, if y'all are like, uh, it doesn't matter. It's something in me that's like, ah, oh, the candle has to be lit. Um, but then Jesus is starting this whole whole thing, um, you know, by himself. Uh, but he was very much a product of the person, John, that came before, before him. And one of the first things that Jesus does uh, in his ministry is he begins to call people into this this work that he is he is doing to invite people along along for the journey by com- cultivating not just disciples but community and friendship with them. Um, I think this is what the essence of what it means um, to be Trinitarian people. I think sometimes, if not a lot of times, we get lost in like theological concepts that we lose like the practicality of what these concepts communicate. Um, and I may have told this, uh, one time somebody asked me, um, you know, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they asked me like, who is the Holy Spirit? And I began to give my theological dissertation to, you know, yeah. Well, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the tr- Trinity. And you see, the Trinity is the expression of God in, in three distinct ways. You know, just trying like, and he started crying. And I'm like, I know, it's very moving. He's like, is it what you feel inside? And I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think maybe it's what you feel inside, I guess. Um, you're right. Uh, please don't ask me trick questions again. Um <laughs> But I think we get lost like, oh, Trinity and is this in the skies concept. Um, but I think practically speaking, uh, we, we have a faith that says God expresses God's self in three distinctive ways, persons, um, together. Community, that God expresses God's self. If this gets your head lost in the clouds... Uh, God expresses God's self through community, um, through this oneness that isn't singular, but is in many ways plural, um, and then invites us to be a part of that community. Did, are y'all lost, or is that, does that make sense? Okay, great, great. So, so what we're called to do, God says, you're part of the community. Uh, we're a community. Come be a part of this community. Um, and to participate in us and in this. And so one of the first things Jesus does is Trinitarian, is, is he expresses the, the oneness of God and invites others to be a part of this vision and mission that he is on. So John includes him into this narrative, and Jesus includes others in to this narrative. Um, and if you don't have like a morning prayer structure, like, I I mean, I really do. I don't want to add anything to your day, to your schedule, but that, and it's also on commonprayer.net as well. And there's an app on your phone, but, uh, if, uh, the book there, I really love this, this prayer each and every morning. Um, uh, oh, oh Lord, let us, now I can't remember it. 
and it's written down in front of me. Um, I'm going to say something nice to myself. O oh Lord, let my soul rise up to meet you as the day rises to meet the sun. Glory to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I love that prayer because that prayer uh, reminds me that I am enfolded into the oneness and the community of God and that I'm also inviting others to be a part of that community as well. I go back to the creation story uh, in Genesis chapter 2 um, where, where, God says, um, where God says to Adam, it isn't right that man should be alone. Um, so he's created this, this human being and everything seems to be right, but the man is, is lonely. Um, and I know a lot of, uh, you know, evangelical narratives can be put on, placed on this that, you know, about marriage. But I really think the Jewish telling of the story is a, is a story that is coming through to say that we as human beings need each other in, our, in one another's lives. Um, and that we aren't, um, and that God didn't create a, uh, God didn't create a clone. Um, God created somebody uh, in the text that says suitable, something that somebody that was almost opposite of somebody different than Adam. And so He created Eve. And what God was doing in humanity was expressing community and how community. Is, is shaped. And this is something in how we build our lives. Um, we do it in marriages. You realize, you know, when you, Kia's like, what is he about to say? Um, in marriages, we, we tend to, marriages, friendships, community, um, we tend to realize, we, we cultivate around us without even realizing it, that we build our lives around people that are opposites in some ways. Um, uh, let me, I can go on the dish. I'm not a pre-rinser in the dishwasher. It's called a dishwasher. Dishwasher. <laughs> Kia, like my mom, washes the dishes prior to them being in the dishwasher. <laughs> Thank you. You look <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Well, no, there are enzymes in your dishwashing detergent that it's meant to eat away at the stuff, and if your stuff is too clean, those enzymes will eat away at your pipes. Okay. Uh, Bradley, if you go get my wallet from my car and give uh, Leslie 20 bucks. <laughs> look it up. Look it up. Regardless of the scientific reasoning, I pre-rinse, and I will pre-rinse. Um, I mean, do whatever. That's right. And you realize in, 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 a, in a relationship or a friendship, as you begin to think, you're, you begin to realize we build our lives around people that see and experience the world in, in maybe some similar ways, obviously, but also there's nuance in like um, um, opposite, opposite ways. And so we are reminded each day as we wake up that God, this is the kind of story that God is grafting us into to be able to see this uniqueness uh, and appreciation in one another. And that our point in one another's lives, and this is, this is something that we can get lost in. Our point in one another's lives is not to be distillers of one another. If I can just get to the purest form, if I can just get Kia to acknowledge that, you know, or if she could just get me to acknowledge, which, um, yeah, well, I do pre-rinse uh, most of the times, <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> um, if, if I could just do if we could just distill people down to the purest form and to where they see the world the way I do, and then, um, then all will be well. But God's hope for each of us is to recognize the beauty and the perspective and the narrative that exists within one another and to realize that it enhances our lives in beautiful 
ways. Uh, we are reminded each day that we are grafted into a story um, that has been uh, that that has formed and shaped us for those that have gone before us. We can think of probably many ways that we might be like um, those who raised us. Um, we can think about how our story is, is folding out now and how the story will unfold in days, days to come. That there is a, a wealth of, of who we are in each of us and that none of us kind of come out of this vacuum into the, to the world. And so when we look at people and even people that might see the world differently than us, it... it um, that person didn't just come out of nowhere. That person is formed and shaped. Um, that storyline comes from somewhere. I think about the stories that exist uh, within this room um, and the people that are now a part of this community. And, and the beautiful thing about I feel like a community like this, or really like any organization that has some sort of like where people gather around, is that you begin to realize as you build community and relationships um, with people who, who don't know one another, that it changes the DNA of our relationships, of who we are, even who we are as a, every time someone new comes into this body and, and, and walks this journey along, it changed like story, who is story church? Well, story church is, is a makeup of those who are part of it. Cause every person that comes to be a part of this community doesn't distill this vision of community down. It enhances who we are as a, as a community, as a, as a people. And so as Jesus begins this journey of calling um, his disciples, one of the first things that Jesus does is he goes and he teaches like in the places that they, uh, that they worship God, in, in the synagogues. And, and most of them were fishermen. And, and he takes this, this practice and this job in their life as something that translates into how they will cultivate a relationship and a friendship with him alongside um, the the journey that they are are coming alongside. Um, if you haven't had a chance, and we post these sermons uh, every week, uh, but to go back and to listen to Gaddy's sermon last week, one of the things he he said is that the more we lean into the presence of the divine in each other's lives, the more God's presence dwells within us. And I think about that uh, so often um, when we meet and we build community with people that we might see the world and experience the world differently than they do, uh, the temptation is to kind of withdraw. Like, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be around difference. I don't want to be around someone who, who makes me feel uncomfortable in some ways because they do things that I, I don't necessarily um, they do or say things I don't necessarily agree with or understand. But one of the things said, like if we lean into to relationships, um, especially with people who who see the world differently than us, more God's presence dwells within us. Um, there is a heart. There's a Harvard study around this idea about um, cultivating happiness. A uh, study that started in 19, 1938, and it's still a study that's uh, going on through the uh, the uh, children, um, the children and the offspring of of the people that were originally in the study. And one of the things that they have come come to realize, uh, and probably the hypothesis of the study, that it's it's intentional relationships um, that bring about happiness. Um, it's not. It's not the, uh, you know, it's not really our jobs, which that brings some fulfillment in our life, but, or it's, it's not, um, it's not that exercise equipment that we probably at all some, some point in our lives, like buy into, like, this will make me happy. Um, but it's intentional relationships. And what they found in the study, 
uh, is that people um, would stop filling out the surveys that they would get every year. Um, and then they would go, the study was all over the, over the country, then they would go to these different locales to, um, to meet with the participants uh, in the study. And they, in the surveys, they would uh, leave a lot of the questions blank. And so they, when they get there to, to meet with the, uh, the study participants, they would ask, ask them about, you know, just how's their life and and they would tell stories of like, yeah, my, my daughter lives an hour down the road. And they asked, well, when's the last time you went to see your daughter down the road? You know, that lives an hour down the road. And they're like, well, I got a bunch of stuff, but I haven't been for years. Um, and it began to be the storyline of, they began to realize why people weren't answering the questions is because it was too painful. Um, there was, and some, some point in these relationships, there was this break, and the person just withdrew. Um, it just became sad. They realized it was too painful to like write the answers in into the survey. But what, what they realized is that is that um people although that there was there's pain in the relationship, people at some point in time just stop working at it. Um and that's one of the things of the study is like uh relationships bring happiness, but the illusion that we can get under is that they don't take work. They don't take intentionality. And that relationships uh, can be painful. Um, and actually, when you're in community with people, uh, you do and say things that hurt one another's feelings. And what makes that relationship stronger is the ability to forgive and to work, work um, through those. I think about all the moments that we gather around each other as a community whether it's in someone's home, whether it's at Bright Penny or at Trackside or over coffee or as we walk in the door into this place, uh, to me, um, those, aren't, uh, those aren't missed moments. Those are, to me, God moments of, of community. Every like minute and second that we spend talking to one another, getting to know one another, are, are holy and sacred um, minutes for which God is cultivating God's presence within our lives. If I could give some concrete next steps that I think that um, are beautiful expressions of Trinity, are beautiful expressions of God in in our life, is to begin to or to continue to build roots into one another's life. That we find places to show up um, in a post-pandemic world. Showing up is such a difficult task. It feels like heavy, heavy lifting. Um, that if we say, you know, I don't know that person, um, and I, or I talk to them for a second, I really would like to know them. Um, I just don't know how to. Well, it's because, well, it takes work, intentionality. If you want to get to know someone, you just have to say, hey, let's... Uh, that's the first thing you say, hey. Um, <laughs> I sometimes catch myself and like, <laughs> ridiculous. Don't start with hey. Um, <laughs> hey. <laughs> but uh, get, co- get coffee with one another. Uh, schedule a time to go, to go get a drink. Get families together at the park. Um, but doing that work to show up in one another's life. And it is work um, to show up, to, to schedule calendars, um, but to cultivate those connections. Because in that, I think when we cultivate those connections, they're not lost. Uh, it, it, they matter because we begin to realize that the people in our lives don't distill, aren't there to like whittle down this essence of who we are. The, the people in our lives, like this study, uh, I think, says that cu- community and relationships bring happiness. I think the people in our lives enhance us. They build us up. And they contribute to our lives in holy 